will be our concluding song, 198. This message this morning a Christian is to be clean <clears throat> Actually In the eyes of God Sin is dirt When it speaks of sanctification Which means holiness Means cleansed A Christian is to be clean From sin there are several scriptures I'd like you to look at before we begin the message. 1 Thessalonians, the 4th chapter, and the 7th verse. For God called us not for uncleanness, but in sanctification. Sanctification, holiness, clean, uncleanness, sin. Direct opposition, one to the other. Then in 2 Corinthians, much more familiar scripture possibly, 2 Corinthians 6. I want us to begin with the 14th verse. And we'll read through 7-1 because actually the paragraphical break should come at 7-1 instead of where we have it marked here. Someone said that, see the chapters in your Bible are not given by inspiration. A man by the name of Stevenson, I believe, is the man who first put the chapters in your Bible. Someone said he was riding a camel, and when the camel moved like that and came down, he put a mark, and that was what the chapter break was. Well, there's just about as much sense in it every once in a while as that. 7-1 uh, is a chapter break, the thought break. So let's read from 6:14. Be not unequally, you notice there's a lot of knots in the Bible. I've been accused of many times of being a negative preacher. Now I want to tell you, there's just a lot of negative in the Bible. There's a lot of knots in there. And if you'll study your Ten Commandments, you'll find out that eight of them are positively negative. Thou shalt not. And I think God pretty well knew uh, that we needed some knots. Not K-N-O-T-S. I got some of those too. But uh, these are N-O-T's. Notice it. Be not unequally yoked with an unbeliever. For what fellowship have righteousness and iniquity? And the answer is none. You can't get along with righteousness and unrighteousness. What communion is light with darkness? You can't mix the two together. And what concord is Christ with Belial? Belial, another name for the devil, that's all. It means a worthless one. Or what portion has a believer with an unbeliever? You don't have. You may think you do, but you don't. If you have a portion with an unbeliever, you can bet your life on one thing, you're not a believer. I hear kids say, well, I know I want to go with this girl. She's not a Christian. Well, I know one thing. You're not either. Or you wouldn't want me hanging around with her. All right. You advertise what you are many times. And what agreement has a temple of God with idols? There isn't any agreement. All of these are, every one of them has answered, no, none. For we are the temple of the living God. Why does he say that? Because the temple is where God dwelt. In the New Testament, the temple of, of God is us. And it abides in us. We are the temple of God. Here's where he abides. Even as God said, I will dwell in them. And that's why when we come to church and all of, all of us thems of the Holy Spirit in us makes up the assembly, we ought to behave ourselves in the house of God and we ought to see to it that our kids behave themselves in the house of God. They don't have sense enough to know it yet, but we're to teach them. God holds us responsible for our children. Now, I will dwell in them, and I will walk in them. And wherever you walk, and you're a Holy Spirit man, you're taking God right along with you. God is in you. I'll walk in them. I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Wherefore? Wherefore always means, here's a conclusion I want you to draw from what I've already said. That's what wherefore means. Come ye out. Because of what I've said, come ye out from among them and be ye separate. The Pharisees were known as separatists, and uh, we are to be a separate people. 
saith the Lord. And by the way, Paul was a Pharisee. And some people make fun of the Pharisees. Don't forget, Paul was a Pharisee, and so was Jesus Christ. He believed the doctrines of the Pharisees. He wasn't a Sadducee. And touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. Notice that? Because that's going to undergird my message this morning. Sin is dirt in the eyes of God. Opposite of sanctification. Unclean, sanctified. Sin, dirt. Holiness, other way. Now, and touch no unclean thing. And I will receive you. And I will be your father, and you shall be to me sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And that's his promise. Now, again, having therefore, what he has already said, this becomes true. Having therefore these promises, what promises? He'll be our God, and we'll be his sons and daughters. Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us, here's that word again, cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, and sin is against both. And that's what I'm going to deal with this morning. Sin is dirt, and the Christian is to be separated from it. Cleanse yourselves from all the found of the flesh and spirit, and one thing you'll never reach, but you can work at it all the time, perfecting. Not having become perfect, but perfecting, working at it all the time, perfecting the holiness and the fear of God. That's what we're to do as Christians. Another scripture that's good for us to look at, Galatians, the fifth chapter, 19. The 21. Might put 18 in with a 2 so it makes us get our setting. 18th verse says, But if ye are led by the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Manifest means you can see them. Which are these? Fornication, premarital sex. Well, that's what it means, amounts to. Adultery actually deals with somebody that's married. Adultery means you adulterate the marriage relationship. Fornication, any sort of illicit sex outside of marriage. But we got a lot of that stuff going on today. Um, 19 again. The works of the flesh are manifest of these. Fornication, and there's my word, uncleanness. It doesn't mean just to your flesh. Because I tell you, your flesh is connected with your spirit. You can't separate a man's body, soul, and spirit. You try to separate them. Each one bears a relationship to the other. Every one of them. Now, he says, but, um, where am I? Uncleanness, the uh, 19th verse. Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, wraths, Factions, divisions, factions a little one, and the divisions a bigger one, and the parties which you have Republicans and Democrats. Well, that's what it is. Each one gets bigger. You have the faction, the little one. Division, the bigger, and a party is the great big thing. So he condemns all three of them. Factions, divisions, and parties. Envyings and drunkenness. Notice how these are all touch every sort of a, you could pretty nearly say here's a catalog of all the sins a man could ever commit. Well, isn't that about right? The fruit of the flesh. Paul's naming them. And, uh, but Paul stays on the safe side while he names a great list. Notice it. In things, drunkenness, revelings. Then he says, just in case I missed something and such like. Southern California used to have a bunch of heretics down there that unless it was named in the Bible, why, it wasn't sin. So if there's no heroin in the Bible, you can take that. No tobacco in the Bible, so you can take that. And there's no burlesque in the Bible, you can take that. And there's no shooting with a six-shooter, so you can do that, I guess. So I heard a fellow preach this at the San Jose Chapel when he got through. He didn't read and such like. 
He just quit there and he says, now that's what God says about sin. And you don't commit sin in the Bible, you're not saying anything about it. I followed him to preach. And I read, and such like. You know, sort of like. <laughs> it just divided the house like that. Some of those Southern California boys wanted it named. And the Bible says, and anything like that. Doesn't make any difference what it is. And such like of which I forewarn you, even as I did forewarn you, that they that practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, there's one more that I want to read, too, in 1 John, the third chapter. 3, 1 to 3. What time am I supposed to get through? 1 o'clock? Oh, okay. I'll make it. What time did I start preaching? Nine, I was supposed to preach at 9. It started at, at, at I mean, at 10? Uh, around 10.30. 30. 30 minutes I have to preach this sermon? 10 o'clock now? Huh? 45 if you need it. All right, I'll tell you what, I'll never make it in 30, I'll tell you that. <laughs> All right, here we go. <clears throat> Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. For this cause the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are, and now are we the children of God, and it is not yet made manifest what we shall be. We know that if he, sh if he shall be manifested, we shall be like him, for we shall see him even as he is. He is in heaven, a place where there's no sin. We're going to be like him someday. And on this earth, we ought to be trying to be like him to the best of our ability here. Amen? All right. I want us to keep this topic in mind in this perspective. The Christian is to be clean. Why? When you tell your child, stay away from that beautiful red-hot stove. Why? Why? He's going to get burnt. That's why. Now, why should we stay away from sin? Why should we stay away from dirt the, regarding our, our physical life and our spiritual life? Why? Well, because of what it does for us. That's why. I'm not going to read because of our time this morning, but if you'll recall the third chapter of the book of Genesis, you'll remember there's where Adam and Eve sinned. And there's where they were separated from God. And as you go back and read that, you cannot help but say sin is a reality. Now, infidels may croak and deny it, and theosophists may say, oh, we're gods, we don't have any sin. And the Christian scientists may say, oh, that's just malicious animal magnetism or a deranged mind or something of that kind. But if we're honest and we read the third chapter of Genesis, you can't help but say sin is real. Why? Well, yesterday, Adam and Eve were happy. Today, they're miserable. Yesterday, Adam and Eve were innocent. Today, they're guilty. Yesterday, Adam and Eve were guileless, and today they're hiding from God. Yesterday, there was a great rosary day, and today they're in the pit of despair and the hobgoblins of fear all about them. Why? Listen. One act directly contra contradictory to God Almighty's command, which was made it sin, one act had made them outlaws and sinners separated from God. It had changed everything. Sin is reality. Peculiar thing. We look back at that. We don't make the application many times. The devil came to Eve and deceived her. The devil's coming to us today. I talked to the man in the hospital. When I was up there, they put him in my room, and pretty soon he asked to leave. He didn't want to be in there. He wanted to smoke, and I didn't want it. And I everlastingly gave him the works on the cigarettes. And you, you might just well be talking to a post, that's all. He didn't believe it. And yet he was wheezing like an old horse of the heaves right at the time. Emphysema and uh, bad emphysema. And he was in there for a heart attack, but sitting there wanting to suck on a cigarette. The Surgeon General has said that smoke is poisonous and it's death. And he is an authority on it. And he is interested in saving the lives of American citizens. What do the cigarette people say? Come on in, folks. We've got lots of seats down here. and Sit down. Well, I, I can preach while you're sitting. <clears throat> what do cigarette people say? Well, the cigarette people say they're delightful. 
Cigarette people say they are cool. You ever see any cool fire? Well, that's what they say it is, cool. They say it is refreshing. Step into a room where a bunch of cigarette suckers have been sitting for about six hours playing poker and take a whiff of the breath. It's worse than walking into a mule barn. <laughs> well, it is. But they say it's refreshing. They say it, there's less tar. They don't tell you the other fellow's got more tar. We say we have less tar. They say they'd rather fight than switch and come up with a black eye. They say it tastes good like a cigarette should. You ever hear that on the radio? Oh, yeah, it's there. Listen to it. They want to kill you for a price. And you pay the price, sucker. Sure. Beautiful Marlboro country. Horses and snow and beautiful country. And you'd think that that's what makes cigarettes. Well, that's the way they got it advertised. Now, I want you to notice this. If you catch a man being a sneak, and you catch him being a liar, and you catch him being deceptive, you cut him off from your association before he gets you again, before he lies about you again, and before he deceives you again, and before he pulls a sneak attack on you again. Isn't that the way we treat men, women? I want you to think of this. The devil who has done nothing else but that. From the time he's first introduced into the history of man, he's a liar and a sneak. Sinners choose him for their master and their friend. And there's a result that comes from it. Why should a Christian be clean well because of what sin does to people that's what he ought, why he ought to be clean i want you there's about four divisions in this sermon if i get them all preached this morning first one we ought to stay clean from sin because sin brings an awful sense of guilt your psychiatrists are running around like crazy here in this country today to try to get people free from the guilt complex as they call it there's only one way to be free from the guilt complex on the sight of God, and that's get your sins forgiven. That's the only way you can. You can fool yourself, and you can lie to yourself, and try to get it off your back, but the thing is still hanging on right in there all of the time. The awful sense of guilt comes. No one can sin and, and, and feel guiltless about it. If you know it's wrong, you know good and well you're guilty. No one can transgress God's laws and then at the same time enjoy the sense of innocency and purity. You cannot do it. And that is essential to your happiness. If you're going to be happy, then there's one thing about it, you're going to have to be right with God. Now Eve thought that the devil was smarter than God. So when he came to talk with her, she chose rebellion against her creator and her sustainer of life and she chose to put herself in bondage to the one who wanted to do one thing, and that was damn her soul and kill her forever. She made the choice. And when she made that choice, she wasn't satisfied to stay that way. She said, now, Adam, come down off of your pedestal and eat with me too. And what is the result? Adam and Eve, before they sinned, they watched for God. Just like a little child watches for his daddy to come home at noon. After they had sinned, God had to call to find them. They were hiding behind the bushes. Before they sinned, they loved to be in the presence of God and they were happy. After they sinned, they tried to hide and they fled from God. Before they sinned, they were in purity. God gave them enjoyment. And after they had sinned, they were guilty and filled with remorse and shame. Before they sinned, they had no shame, no condemnation. After they sinned, they, were, they felt they, the pollution that every sinner feels when he's in it. Before they sinned, they had no sense of pollution or dirt. After they sinned, they were dirty and they knew it. Before they sinned, they were God's friends. After they sinned, they were God's enemies and they knew they were God's enemies and they fled from him. And whoever, right today, that's sin, that's dirt, that's filth. Whoever today leaves the path of virtue, 
He parts company with God, and he parts company with contentment, and he parts company with rest. He's under the penalty and the guilt of sin. There's one outstanding illustration of this in the scripture. Remember old Jacob had 12 sons, two of them from his favorite wife. The oldest one of those sons was named Joseph. The second one was named Benoni by his mother, which meant son of my sorrow. She died when he was born. After she was dead, he changed the name of Benoni to Benyamin, which means son of my right hand. Now, God loved Joseph. He was his favorite son. He was the one that was to inherit first place because he was the first son from his favorite wife. So he gave him a, a coat of authority and incurred the jealousy of all of his brothers. His dad used him as a sort of a spy and he sent him down to check out on how the brothers were coming along down there and he came back and gave a bad report. If you want to get in trouble with your brothers, why well, just uh, snitch on them. Tell your dad. And that's what he did. And the brothers hated him for that. So the next time the dad sent Joseph down, they said, let's kill him. And in the meantime, he'd had some visions, some dreams about them bowing down before him. <coughs> and they said, let's kill this dreamer. And we'll see how his dreams turn out. And if it hadn't been for one of the brothers, it would have killed him. Instead of that, they sold him into slavery. They knew it was wrong. They never could get away from that feeling. Years went by. Famine came. It looked as though they were going to starve. They made a long trip on foot, maybe on a donkey, down into Egypt to get food to sustain them. When they got down there, they got in Joseph recognized them. They got in trouble with Joseph, and they were put in jail. And do you know what they said? One brother said to the others, I know what's the matter. I know what's the matter. Joseph! They couldn't get away from it. And every sinner that stands before God is not only going to remember Joseph, he's going to remember a thousand other things that he did that made him wrong with God. And it's inside that sin damns the sinner. And he can't get away from it. They couldn't get away from their own guilt. And they suffered for it. And I want you to know this. Whenever you dirty yourself up a sin, you're going to suffer for it. Old Oklahoma Desperado, Robert and his buddy, were hiding down in a valley of scrub oak in Oklahoma. Close of the day came, Dad sent the son about 10 years old down to round up the cows. They were down there in the meadows and the fields. That boy came out, little hill, dropped down jumped and ran and let out a yell and whistled and sang and ran and jumped and he was going down to get the cows. One desperate brother turned to the other and he said to him, John, he said, I would give all of the money that these bloody hands have ever touched in my life if I could just be like that kid again. You know what he wanted? He wanted to be clean again. He wanted to be innocent again. He wanted to be pure again. And peace and contentment and joy and the sense of no guilt is the thing that he desired. Older people, of course I don't belong in that group, but older people sometimes say, backward, turn backward, old time in my flight, and make me a child again, just for tonight. They have another poem that they sing, too, where they quote, How dear to my heart are the scenes of my childhood. Fond recollections present them to view. The orchard, the meadow, deep tangled wildwood, and every rude spot that my infancy knew. Why are those memories so dear? Aren't there orchards now? Certainly there are orchards now. Aren't there, aren't there groves now? And aren't there scenes of childhood still around us? Certainly there are. But the thing that they want is the time when they remember when they were innocent in the sight of God. No guilt. 
They want to be that way again. When sin was unknown, they want it to be that way again. They want it to be like it was when you're a child, morning without a cloud, roses without a thorn, bees with no stinger. Yeah, that's what they want. And I want to tell you, the only way you can ever be right with God is be clean. And if you've sinned, get right with God through his cleanser. Better than 409. The day of innocence left. The day that sin entered in. And that day you headed for hell. You say, well, people in the world, aren't they happy? I want to tell you something. Before I was a Christian, I got mixed up with some of this stuff. I was in the Navy, and they get you in a lot of trouble. You pass by a tavern, you'll hear loud guffaws. You'll hear some big old belly laugh come out of it. But they're not happy. You know what they have? They're having fun. What is fun? Fun is the devil's substitute for Christian's joy. And it is spurious, it's a fake, and it's an imposter, it's a sham, and it's an imitation. Those very fellows that are in that place, they can't laugh until they get half full of whiskey. There's no joy inside. They've got to buy it and put it inside. And it isn't joy. It's just that fun business that they're having. My grandfather made whiskey for 27 years. And it ruined his family. They're the biggest bunch of sour pusses you ever saw in your life. The whole bunch of them. I was down there a few years ago. And uh, one of my cousin's girls had just won the state of Kentucky's queen, beauty queen, and all the photographers at her house taking pictures and pictures and pictures, and when we came to call on them. And this cousin came out. We met, talked for a little while. She's a woman, I suppose, at that time about 40 years old, something like that. I was probably 55 or 60. She came over and she put her arm on my, up on my shoulder. She looked me right straight in the eyes. And she said, Archie, thank God I've seen one word that could smile. You look happy. She had never seen it. That whole family, 12 children, had been damned and their grandchildren damned with the sin they'd gotten into and they were the sourest people in the world. And you just watch sinners. Well, they're strained faces. You watch sinners that are trying to find happiness and they buy a fishing pole and they buy a hunting lodge and they buy a, a motor home and they buy speed boats and they buy everything you can think of to try to find some happiness and you watch them when they're using it and they're the saddest bunch of sour pusses there is. We went up to the lake the other day. My wife was feeling pretty low, and so I thought, well, we'll get her out of the house. She'd been there for three weeks and, and uh, taken pain pills and, and didn't have any appetite, and she just felt terrible. And so, and, and she's always been, I mean, right up there just going like that. And I've tried for 50 years to get her to take a nap in the afternoon. And I tell you, for the last three weeks, I haven't had to try. She's been napping all morning and napping all afternoon. But anyway, uh, we took her up there to this lake. And there was a, they had to be a wealthy family or about $40,000 in debt because of the equipment they had. And when they got in that boat, a powerful speedboat, and started out on, the, out on that lake, you, I, I never saw anybody that looked more discontented and more sourpussed and more, no, 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 no happiness to it. Why? I'm not right with God. Sin, and they know it. A second reason why we ought to be clean, we ought to be separated from sin, is because we become, when we do sin, we become corruptors of other people. Eve, the first thing she gave unto her husband, and he did eat. And this has been repeated a billion, billion times. No man lives to himself, and no man dieth unto himself. 
And in sin, Eve sought to drag old Adam right down to her level. Anything in the world the day before, Eve would have done to make Adam happy. Now she tries to drag him down to her same ruination, ruination and despair. <coughs> drinkers try to get other people to be drinkers. Come on, have a drink. That's before you become a drinker. After you're hooked on it, people, as anxious to get other people converted to Christ as the drunkard is to get other people on the bottle. I don't know what I told you about or not, but one Thanksgiving, we used to have a little boat, family boat, the paint boat. And uh, my son and I went down Thanksgiving Day and we were painting, working on the boat. And right across the dock was two guys in another boat and they were both drinking. And I needed a pair of pliers, and so I went over where they were, and I said, you fellas have an extra pair of pliers? They said, yeah, sure. Come on, have a drink. And he stuck up the fist. Have a drink. And I said, no, I don't care for any this morning. Thank you. And uh, they didn't hand me the pliers right away. They're bound to determine I have a drink with them. I said, okay, I'll have a drink with you if you'll come over and have a drink with me first. Okay, buddy. So I crawled out of a boat and got up on the dock and staggered around and got over and finally <coughs> fell into my boat and I'm um, licking their chops. I reached up in the medicine closet and I brought out a quart of castor oil. I said, now have a drink. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, but we don't want any of that stuff. And I said, and I don't want any of your stuff any more than you want my stuff. Now, you guys get it? Yeah, yeah, we got it. And whenever you converted to Christ, you'd just as soon drink castor oil as you had to drink whiskey. That's just the difference. But they were bound determined to get me to drink. What is it? They wanted to become a corrupter of somebody else. Drinkers always work like that. Homos, unnatural sex perverts, and lesbians are always looking for some new suckers. They're out there working at it. That's why they've grown in this country like they have. We had a, a lesbian in the church in Portland. Nobody knew it. If I had any sense, I'd known what I do now, I'd have known it. But I didn't know it. And she was latched like a leech on one of the girls right there in the church. They kept up that relationship for three or four years that I know of. Now, I don't know where the old butch is. But I know the girl, she's as crazy as a bed bug. And they've had her in the insane asylum three times. Every time she gets agitated, she jerks her clothes all off. And they put her back in the jail again. But it all started with this old lesbian gal working on her. And that's the way they do. Sinners are always looking for another sucker to get hooked in on it. <coughs> but remember this, there's only two camps. You're either laboring to rescue sinners... Or you're dragging sinners down to damnation. Every one of us. Outlaws are always trying to get others to be breaking the law. And liars are always trying to get somebody else to be a liar and accuse them of being liars. Thieves are always running in gangs if they can because it's safer and they want somebody else wrapped up in it. Dope addicts are always getting somebody else hooked on it and spreading the stuff. Smokers are always trying to get you to smoke. Drinkers trying to get you to drink. Immoral people trying to get you to be immoral. Gossipers trying to get you to gossip. And church deserters trying to get other deserters to desert. They work at it. We always become damners of other people. Sin makes us dirty and filthy in the eyes of God. And it makes us despoilers of others. We were meeting in Oregon City several years ago. They sent me down to call on a young lady, but before they sent me down there, they told me that her sister, who was a harlot, prostitute, a whore, was home at the time trying to hook her sister in it for $50. I couldn't believe my ears. I went down to call on the girl that was backslidden in the church that she was going to try to get, and this harlot came out in the back room. And I asked if the girl was there, forgot her name now. But anyhow, uh, 
she says no, and she just came over real close, and she said, well, wouldn't I do? Back in those days, I had pretty good lungs, and I was right close, and I just let out a no that would have shaken her grandmother in Missouri. I heard that was loud enough that you could hear it clear across the street. Boy, did she straighten up and get out of the way. She was there trying to hook her own baby sister into a life of a whore. Sin makes us polluters of others. A third thing, the reason why a Christian ought to be clean, ought to be separated from sin, is because it not only makes us curse others, and it not only curses herself, but it causes us to become a curse to our own children and to their children. Here's a scripture that I hadn't thought so much about until I got to making this sermon. Numbers 14, 18. It says, The Lord is long-suffering and of tender mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgressions, but by no means clearing the guilty visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. Now, when that was given, they didn't understand anything about it except God said that's the way it was. That's good enough if we think about it. But now we know <coughs> this is scientifically true. The James law and the genetics law, there's wrapped up in the sperm and the egg of every conception, three generations of characteristics. And if you're a damnable sinner, you're going to pass it on to your own kids and to their kids. You say, well, why would God do that? Well, I'll tell you why God will do it. There's just a lot of people don't have any respect for themselves or any love for themselves, and they don't, as they say, well, don't give a damn what happens to us, and they don't. They love their kids. They don't hurt them. And even when they don't love their kids, they really love their grandchildren. God says, I'll pass your sins not to you, but to your children and to your grandchildren. Yes, and it sometimes goes to your great grandchildren. So we ought to be clean. We ought to be pure in God's sight. We ought to be separated from sin because it makes us not only to ruin ourselves, but it makes us to ruin our own children. Let's look in the Bible, see an illustration. Cain committed murder. Just a little while out of the garden. But where were the seeds sown? When Adam and Eve deliberately rebelled against God, they sowed the seeds of disobedience and it ripened into murder in the life of this man Cain. Why did he kill his brother? He killed his brother fighting about the law instead of obeying the law. Now, they knew better than to kill one another. We don't have the law written down, but they knew better. They couldn't have been condemned for it. <clears throat> God forbid heathen marriage in the Old Testament. Why? Well, when you go back and read the history of those people, <laughs> see, there, we think nowadays it's pretty bad in our country, and it is. We say, look at these Hollywood pictures and these triple X movies and all of this kind of stuff. I'll tell you something. Their country was a lot worse. They made a religion out of that stuff. And here was their temples with naked seducers right out in front of it playing their seductive music while the Jews are going to the tabernacle to worship God. Contrary to Diana of Ephesus with a string of breasts clear around her was the Virgin Mary. In the Old Testament, the Jew was just as high above this kind of stuff by the laws that God has given as the Virgin Mary was uh, above uh, old Diana. Now, as they went to church, they had to go by these places where their chief business of, of, of religion was sex intercourse of every kind you can think of. And gonorrhea and syphilis and a thousand other diseases and aches and pains and shankers and everything else that go with it was completely rotting that country, and God said, kill every one of them, not only that killer cattle, because it is contaminated to the stuff too. Get it out of there. What does sin do? Uncleanness and filth, it makes us to kill not only ourselves, but to damn our own children, our own heredity. God forbid their marriage. There's a reason for it. Solomon didn't pay attention to it. 
And when Solomon got through with his throne, his reign, because of his intermarriage, he was taken away from God, his son was taken away from God, and the kingdom of Israel split two in the south and twelve and ten in the north. Why? Sin. Split the northern kingdom wide open. We have it in this country, all around about us. The sin that curses our children. We had in Portland a family in the church. We preached 33 years in one place, a lot of things happened. <coughs> My study was broken into. <coughs> it just happened I'd moved. And I was had my study downstairs, and these kids didn't know it. And they broke into my study, and the things that I had in it that they wanted, they didn't get, but they did steal Brother Yoder's typewriter and all tape recorder, some other kind of stuff that he had. And um, one of the sons of this in this family came to his dad and told him, he said, now I didn't steal it, but he said I was with the kid that did do it. So we got the kid, come to find out they're both in on it. So when he brought the member of the church in to have some conference with him, why, he began to sob. He just simply broke down and bawled. Now everybody in the community, he was well respected. He was an honorable man. He had a, a respected job in the community. And he was a good citizen. But he said, gentlemen, before I was converted to Christ, I was just like that kid. He said, I'd steal anything that was loose. You see what God meant when he says that you pass on your tendencies? You pass on your characteristics? You don't realize it, but I want to tell you, most of us don't realize it. We are a great deal like our parents. I walked down the street the other day and I just glanced at the one of those big glass windows, and I'm like, I was just startled. There's my dad. I walked just like him. I looked, turned, and looked just like him, and even my hands hung just like him. We pass on to our children, and I'll tell you what, if it hadn't been for the grace of God, I might be a drunkard and dead in the grave now. I'd rather get in the ring with Ali right today and fight him barehanded than I had to take a drink of whiskey because I know what it did for my dad. I know what it did for the whole family. I know what it would do for me if it did it again. What do we do? We not only damn ourselves with our sins and our filthy uncleanness before God, but we damn our own children. Syphilis, a terrible heritage to hand on down to your children. I don't want you to know it's done. And that's done right along. We had a man in the community, very fine contractor, and that's a boy. That fellow didn't do much pencil work. He did it right here. He could just walk around the building and measure it off and look at it, and he'd say that'll cost so much, and he wouldn't miss it by just small amount. Wonderful head. <clears throat> His wife died. He became a chaser. Contracted syphilis. He died in the in the in the insane asylum in Stockton, California, eaten up with ants. That's what he thought he had. <coughs> he would just start scratching at his loins and scream, "Red ants! Red ants! Eat him up!" Syphilis. His son, handsomest boy in town, Johnny. Oh, Johnny, about six feet, three or four inches tall. And he was a soda squirt back in those days. That was really something, you know, when, when the sodas first came out, you know, poured from one glass to the other and how they used to do the stuff. Maybe some of you don't remember it. Oh, Johnny was the most popular guy in town. He was a chaser just like his dad. He married one of the wealthiest girls in around Bakersfield, and the dad, when they married, gave him 20 acres of oranges and a nice home. They'd been married about two years. She was pregnant. When the baby was born, it was just simply a mess. Dead and corruption. Well, the doctor said, well, it's just one of those things that happened. Can't understand it and so on. But everybody noticed that Johnny looked pretty glum. About two years later, she became pregnant again. 
The very same thing then. Their house is located on one corner of the 20 acres of oranges, and Johnny walked to the opposite corner of the 20 acres, sat down into the tree, took a 12-gauge shotgun and stuck it in his mouth and took his toes and pulled both triggers. And you can imagine what happened to his head. Why? He knew what he had done. He knew the syphilis that he had had. He knew what it had done for two times for the children that was born in his home. Sin makes us not only to damn ourselves, it makes us corruptors of our own children. We ought to stay away from it. And here's the fourth thing that sin does for us. <coughs> and a half an hour is up, can I have ten more minutes? <coughs> you just run on to one o'clock today then, Albert, and I'll make it all right. <coughs> All right, finally, sin costs us not only to damn ourselves, but to damn our children, but it brings sorrow and it brings death in the end. In the day ye eat thereof, God said to Adam and Eve that ye shall die. And the New Testament says the wages of sin is death. And there's nobody that's going to escape it. No way to get away from it. Death is a sin's final payday on this earth. And the second death is the final payday in eternity and eternal retribution. Sin is death to joy here. It's death to peace here. It's death to genuine love here. It's death to innocency here. It's death to happy homes here. And it's death to godly children here. And it's death to hope. It's death to happiness. It's death to character. It's death to morals. It's death to your soul right here on this earth. Sin wrecks. And it ruins. And it rots. And it sinks. And it bites and it mildews, and it destroys, and it damns everything it touches. The Christian is to be clean from sin. And it's been that way from Eden, and it will be that way until the judgment. If you don't think it does, you just go down to any big city and go down on the skid row and take a look at them. If you think sin brings happiness, just go down and look at those guys. Hardened faces, if they're conscious, or there they are, propped up against the wall, uh, they look like they're asleep and they've puked all over themselves, and maybe the bowel movement right in their pants right there on the floor, and they've urinated and it's run all over the street, and you'll know to know something, they don't look very happy. Sin damns people. The Height Asbury uh, district in, in San Francisco when you go down there and go through that, you see those unkempt, sloppy, dirty, shaggy, shiftless immorals inhabiting a jungle made up of syphilitics and hepatitis and fights and murders, and they call themselves the love people. I Asbury. Sin clear up to their necks. <clears throat> go to the prison. Here a year or so ago, I was invited to speak at the federal prison in... Oh, uh, Tehatchby. I couldn't think of a name for a minute. Tehatchby? How many of you ever been through the Tehatchby Pass? California? From Bakersfield over to San Bernardino through the pass and go through there. Well, that's where Tehatchby is located. They had a great earthquake up there several years ago. And uh, the chaplain had been one of my students and when I was in school in, in Eugene years and years ago. He heard I was coming through. He said, come in and want you to speak to, the, to our prison a service on a Sunday morning. So I stopped in. He had a place all paid for me in the trailer court to put my trailer in. The next morning he came, picked me up, and we went down there. My wife went with me to play the organ. We had a nice organ. And as I stood there before those fellows and just took a look over that audience, about half as many as there are here this morning, because they don't force them to go to church, have an opportunity to go. And I looked over those fellows, the rebellious faces hardened faces, haggard faces, sad faces, hopeless faces, and faces filled with fear and murderous faces. There's one man there that morning that is in four murders. A great big Negro, six feet and about six inches tall. He could have been a wonderful basketball player, physique all. Oh, but there he was. He'd been in jail now for 16 years becoming gray. And as he sat there that morning and listened, I couldn't help but think, sin 
It brings in its finality death, but before it comes all of the sorrow that goes with sin, here I was looking at it. Finality, death. I used to preach in a mission down there in Portland. I didn't, I found out it was useless, so I quit. But I was preaching the mission down there. There used to be an old guy come in there, he'd been a lawyer, a big corporation lawyer in Philadelphia. And you could see at one time that man had been a brain. He wore a, a black tie, a big black flowing bow tie that hung down, and he was always dressed uh, immaculately, uh, but he was a walking stew bum. Drunk all the time, but never down, just drunk all the time. He could only draw so much a month from his estate, they'd fixed it that way, and all he did was drink it up and live off of the, live off of the various missions, eat their uh, donuts and drink their coffee. Now that night when I finished preaching, he came down to me, and uh, he could do it. He could look you just as straight in the face, and he was drunk, but his head still worked. And he said to me, that is the most sensible sermon that I've ever heard preached on this mission. He said, that makes sense. He said, what you preach tonight, said anybody that can think and understand that, he said, I'd like to talk with you sometime. I said, I'd like to talk to you right now. No, he said, yeah, no, no, can't talk to you now. <clears throat> the next time I came down to preach, he came up again. He said, I'm glad to see you back. He said, I can appreciate that sermon too. He said, I want to talk to you sometime. But not now. I don't know how many times he did that. I suppose maybe a dozen times. One night, right in the middle of my preaching, the, the man, the superintendent of the institution, was called out. And when he came back, he came back shaking his head. Just as soon as the benediction was over, he came down to where I was, and he said, the old man, the old lawyer, is dying across the street upstairs, and he wants to see you. <clears throat> I didn't even get my hat. We rushed across the street, went over there, and he was just barely conscious. I leaned over his bed, put my hands over the back of the bed, single bed, and down as close to his ear as I could, I was trying to tell him uh, to repent and to turn to Christ Jesus, and if he is able to, we'd be bad, we would baptize him. And all of a sudden, he just made a kind of a snort and a gurgle, and he was dead. The wages of sin, uncleanness, dirt before God, opposite the sanctification, is death. He was not only going out dying physically, he was going out dying forever away from God, separated from God. Now every sinner is warned, but God has a perpetual sin eradicator. He's the one that can make us clean again. Listen rapidly. Matthew 1 21, and he shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 26, 28, and this is the blood of the New Testament was shed for the remission of sins. Luke 24, 47, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in all nations. Acts 2, 38 is for the remission of sins. Acts 13, 8, 13, 38, he says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which... You could not be justified by the law of Moses. In 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's no reason why any sinner, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, there's no reason why any sinner should die in his sin. Because God has made a way for every one of us to be saved from our sins. And when we're saved from our sins, I want you to listen to this carefully. When we're saved from our sins and we're forgiven our sins, God doesn't hold it against us forever. Down here, people say, oh yes, I forgive you, and on. I wouldn't hold any grudge and so on, but they don't want anything to do with you. That's not the way God forgives. God forgives. Reminds me of a king. There was a rebellion going on, and it was causing turmoil in his kingdom, and he said, every one of those rebels, when they're caught, they're going to kill them. That was a decree that went forth, every one of them. 
trouble went on, went against the rebels, and the whole group of them came in under their leader and surrendered to the king and said, no more rebellion, we're sorry for what we've done, we, and, and we come to plead mercy at the throne of our king. The old king said, I will forgive you. And his counselor stepped up and he said, King, you said that you were going to kill every one of those rebels. He said, I said I would kill every rebel. But he said, I don't see any rebels. Do you? I don't see any rebels. One of these days, at God Almighty's throne, when we appear before him, one time we were rebels. One time we were dirty, filthy sinners that damned ourselves and damned our children and damned everybody around about us. <clears throat> but we repented of our sins. We were forgiven of our sins. We were made new creatures in Christ Jesus and we stand before him not as a rebel, but as a blood-purged, cleansed, Holy Spirit-filled child of God. We come to him just a sinner, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. We're going to sing just one verse of the song this morning. If you're here and you've been dabbling in sin, you're dirty in it, you know you are, you're a disgrace to yourself and to God, and in your quiet times when you have time to think, you know you are, why don't you come this morning and say, God forgive me. Help me, Lord, to live like you want me to live. To be no longer a temple of idols, but to be the temple of God. While we stand and sing it together, you come. Just as I am.